Welcome everyone to this Thursday night Dharma talk at Mountain Cloud. Welcome on this mountain. Welcome in the cloud. Zendos without walls, without floors. No place for borders. One student dreamed recently of going to sit. She opened the door to her room and it was empty. All the furnishings gone. What an invitation. A dream of emptiness. This is the dream. So what are we dreaming in this season of spring? Spring in the northern hemisphere. The April full moon just passed, named the pink moon by native peoples for the wildflowers that bloom this time of the year. The full moon in the wake of the solar eclipse with its wide path of totality. One shining, one radiant darkness. Monday this week was Earth Day, a bittersweet celebration. And that night, Passover or Pesach began. Liberation from slavery in the midst of all that enslaves us now. Ramadan ended the day after the eclipse at sundown on April 9th. Life. All this functioning. A dream. Empty. And yet, One of the privileges of sharing this practice, this dharma, and of teaching is meeting with students. Just this week, I met with someone whose life is in flux. Uncertainty and worry all around. The student recalled a story from a sutra, a parable told by the Buddha. Walking through a field, a person comes upon a tiger and takes off running. They come to a precipice, see a vine or some growth of vines there. And they lower themselves down over the cliff. Looking up, there's a tiger. Looking down, another tiger. Then a mouse appears and starts gnawing on the vine. A total predicament. Nowhere to turn. Looking straight ahead, the person notices a bright, ripe strawberry growing out of a crevice in the rock. Imagine the sweet taste. One luscious berry. What is the berry in the parable? What is it now? Calls to mind a poem by the Sambo Zen master Sylvia Ostertag. The poem is called Right Now. (laughs) 
when you look into what is right now, how it is, and then check how it came about, that it has turned out like this. It may be that suddenly you think that this is now. This now is nothing else but the result of yesterday, a long, long yesterday. When you look into what is becoming right now, as it comes into being, then you may get a sense that the now is also endlessly kindled by tomorrow, by a great, great tomorrow. When you look into the now until looking itself, melds with the now, until you yourself are nothing but now, then it may dawn on you how all that was and is becoming is one whole, an eternal present, a single right now. borderless, whole, excluding nothing, this, now. These pieces, the season unfolding, the ways we mark time and events, the parable, the poem, are all threaded through a question that came up in the Aging Buddha's gathering that Scott led last Sunday. The question of loss, of grief, of how to face death. What does our practice have to say to this? As you heard this group, and I saw online, the group plans to meet again May 5th, this time focusing on the theme of grief. So for tonight, I'd like to take up a koan that might serve as a pointer to these essential questions and to the eternal now that holds everything in its capacity. This is case 94 in the Book of Serenity, Book of Equanimity, or Shoyoroku. It's called Tozan Unwell. Here's the case. Tozan was unwell. A monk asked, Your reverence is unwell. Is there anyone who does not become ill? Tozan said, There is. The monk said, Does the one who does not get ill take care of your reverence? Tozan said, the old monk is properly taking care of that one. The monk said, how about when your reverence takes care of that one? Tozan said, the old monk doesn't see the illness. The old monk does not see that there is illness. A little opaque, but it's okay. Just washing over us. So let's take a look. 
this Tozan, thought to be Tozan Ryokai, or Dongshan Liangji, deeply, deeply awakened master, ninth century. He had a long list of notable heirs, and his own lineage comes down from Sekito or Shitu. I can never say that right. Sure, To. Sekito, the author of the Song of the Grass Hut, and then to Yaoshan or Yaksan, and then Yunyan or Ungan, and then Tozan or Dongshan. Tozan started studying Chan or Zen when he was a boy. He heard the line from the Heart Sutra, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And he asked his teacher, I have eyes, ears, a nose, and so on. So why does the sutra say there is none? The teacher sent him on to work with a master. It said that Tozan was 10 when he left home to train at a monastery. And then at 21, he went to Shaolin Temple, Shaolin Monastery, this place made famous by Bodhidharma's nine years of sitting facing the wall. And there Tozan took the uh, final monk's precepts. Then he began wandering. He studied with Nansen, then with Isan, and then finally he settled down with Ungan. At 52, Tozan established a school that at any given time had between 500 and 1,000 students. He's the founder, quite famously, of the Soto or Kaodong School in China, one of the five houses of Chan. <clears throat> As a student, and there's quite a record, Tosan kept having experiences, but he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to see more clearly. There's a scene where Tozan finally leaves his beloved teacher, Ungan, to seek for himself. Here's the record of that scene of his leaving. Ungan said, if you leave, it will be difficult to see one another again. Tozan said, it will be difficult to not see one another. Just as Tozan is about to depart, he says, if in the future someone asks about the truth of your teaching, how should I answer? The record says, after a long pause, Ungan said, just this, is it. Just this is it. Tozan leaves carrying his doubt and then crossing a stream. He sees his reflection in the water and is suddenly deeply, thoroughly awakened. The record says he awakened to Ungan's meaning. And he wrote thereafter what's become quite a famous awakening verse. I've read it before. I was putting it on the page today. And you just can't hear it twice. Here's his verse. 
Avoid seeking elsewhere, for that's far from the self. Now I travel alone, everywhere I meet it. Now it's exactly me. Now I'm not it. It must thus be understood to merge with thusness, or sometimes translated suchness. Can you hear Ungan? Just this is it. So what does all this have to do with this case? Shoyoroku 94. Let's hear it again. Tozan was unwell. A monk asked, your reverence is unwell. Is there anyone who does not become ill? Tozan said, there is. The monk said, does the one who does not get ill take care of your reverence? Tozan said, the old monk is properly taking care of that one. The monk said, how about when your reverence takes care of that one? Tozan said, the old monk does not see that there is illness. So in this case, Tozan is sick, actually about to die. A monk visits an even then <laughs> with his master on his deathbed, asks for teaching. Master, you're sick. Is there one who is not sick, who never becomes sick? What about this sickness? Maybe this student has heard Tosan's teaching. Like that famous case where a monk asks, uh, keep in mind, they practiced in open air zendos in seasons. Hot, cold, rain, snow. So there's this exchange. A monk asks, when the cold season comes, where can one go to avoid it? And Tosan says, why not go where there is no cold? The monk asks eagerly, what is the place where there's no cold? You know, is, is there such a place? And Tosan says, when it's cold, let it be so cold, the cold kills you. And when it's hot, let it be so hot, the heat kills you. It might seem violent, the language, but it's this great invitation. Nothing extra, nothing outside it. Let just that one remain. Is there one who does not become ill? There is. Does that one take care of you? That one, that essential fact, that empty, infinite nothing at allness, does it make any difference? Does it make you well? Tozan responds, the old monk is properly taking care of that one. Emptiness, form, which is which? It's just one, just this is it, actually. 
being ill expresses the whole fact. I'm coughing. I'm aging. I'm losing my friends. They're dying. I'm facing death. Each bit. All of it. Mountains, rivers, great wide earth, all time, all space, and exactly this. How is it when you take care of that one? How is it when the whole of existence is fully, freely expressed in that one, in exactly the one who is sick? And what about this taking care this boundless capacity. Tozan says, the old monk doesn't see that there is illness. Another way of saying that is that this illness, this feeling so well. It swallows everything. It occupies everything. Mm -hmm. Emptiness doesn't see it. Form doesn't divide it. That one that one we truly are doesn't distinguish, doesn't carve out a boundary. There is something like illness as opposed to being well. Where could any difference, any trace of separation reside? There's just no purchase from which to carve it up. There's nothing like that. And how does it show itself, that one? Just this is it. Just this. Tozan is pointing to emptiness. Kovroshi liked to show it with his palm. And form. Form and emptiness. One reality. And what is it? empty of any fixed substance, empty of any separation, empty of any thing. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, and at the same time, endlessly abundant, beyond any measure. It can do anything, including being ill, getting older, facing loss, facing death. This emptiness, vast and void, Bodhidharma said. And it's the wellspring of compassion. Front of hand, back of hand, your whole body Let loss, separation, scarcity dissolve in that. (laughs) 
fundamental reality can heal us from the incurable disease. Though we won't be cured. To see this for oneself is to know you're healed from the beginning. More than once, a practitioner has said, I don't want to die without Kensho, without awakening. We practice, not so that, but to fall into what is right here, the fullness, the entirety, the dynamism that presents itself moment to moment is what you are. Kensho isn't something out there. Your very being is an act of care. Properly taking care of that one. Falling off a cliff, eating a strawberry. Who is taking care of whom? Who is that one? Mm. Sweet. Or just falling. In the record of Tozan's teaching, there's one more line in this exchange. He asks his monks, when you leave this skin bag, where will you go and see me again? Hear the echo of Tozan when he's leaving Ungan. It will be difficult not to see each other. The monks don't answer. So Ungan, Tozan, uh, responds with a verse. Sort of see these bookends, this opening and this lay teaching. Students as numerous as Sands and the Ganges, his students, but none are awakened. They err by searching for a path in another person's mouth. If you wish to forget form and not leave any traces, wholeheartedly strive to walk in emptiness. How do you do that? Walk in emptiness. Just this is it. According to the record, a few days before Tozan died, he announced his death. (coughs) His attendants shaved his head and helped him dress. Then Tozan had the bell rung to summon the assembly so he could say goodbye. The record says it looked like he died. And the monks, his monks began to wail. Tozan suddenly opened his eyes and chastised them. What are you doing? Are you so attached to things? Where is your authentic practice? And then he directs them to organize a delusion banquet. (laughs) Maybe that's what we're having here. As the story goes, After a week of preparations, Tozan takes one bite of the meal, then telling his students not to make a great commotion over nothing, he goes to his room and dies. How, in the face of death, 
do we take care of that one? Master, please don't die. Scott mentioned that tomorrow morning, early, I travel uh, to this black forest region of Germany. There, uh, at this beautiful center, uh, kindred to Mountain Cloud, is Sonnenhof, uh, way up in the mountains, black forest. Only sounds are bird song and cowbells and an occasional tractor. So John Gaynor and I will be uh, co-leading this four-week session, Mini Ango. We've done it, I think this is the sixth time together. There was a pause of two years of COVID. For the first several years, uh, we had a picture of Silvio Ostertag on the altar there at Sonnenhof in the Zendo. It's like uh, her smile just lit up the room. And there, at the end of each day, we've fallen into the pattern of reading a poem often one of Sylvia's. Last year, after the session, a German student sent an email beginning with a poem by Sylvia. And I'm just going to close with a few of these as a way of offering what I'm about to go and receive. This one is called Center. In the center of the now, there is no time, no before nor after. In this center, now. Then the student wrote about the poem, this email. You read it on an evening when I, for the first time, experienced samadhi for a really long time, nearly the whole time of the 25 minutes, diving up only a few minutes, a few times, to sink into it freshly. It was an amazing sitting, not to repeat, but perhaps another time, suddenly, unexpected. And afterward, this poem about the timeless now, It felt like an imprint in me which changed something, which pops up sometimes in sitting or daily life. No before, no after, in this center, now. Here's one more poem. This one's What is Real? When we truly practice, we seek and hope to meet and recognize what is real, wherever we may stand or walk. Who shows us what is real? Vegetables, the stair landing, the window. How can we see it? We cannot see it, but what is real within us sees at seas. And just one more. This is called indestructible. Whether I live or die, it is completely indestructible. If I search for it, I do not find it. And yet it breathes right now, silently out and in. That one, breathing you, taking care of you, 
and you precisely as you are taking care of that one. So take care, Mountain Cloud, and see you soon.